And when you do it under a planned system, like I do, and where there's planning from the beginning stages of digitization to the end, the end product tends to be better. The metadata tends to be better and it's better organized. Yeah. You know, if, if you go to our Hoosier State Chronicles, our state library site where we have our newspapers, we have better metadata and we have better information and organization of our papers than newspaper archive or newspapers.com, which are privately owned. We just do because it goes to additional layers of work yeah. and planning to get us to where we are. Um, Hi, hi, and welcome to Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about leftist books and and analyze them through a Marxist and anarchist uh, lens. That 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 almost sounded professional. That was pretty good. <laughs> that was pretty good, man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm here with Justin Clark. Thanks for hi, joining. Corey. Me. Thank you. Hi, Corey. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. Fantastic, man. And we're getting into fall. Can't believe we're recording this at the end of September. Can't believe it's already going to be October. Yeah. It feels like the last two months have like flown by. I have yeah. both done, it feels like I've both done a lot and nothing. It's a very, <laughs> it's that weird yeah. thing. You're like, oh, there's so much more. There's so much more to do. But, um, but yeah, no, no, it's, it's, um, no, it's been, it, it'll be, it'll be very exciting to get into the fall season and get to wear jackets and hoodies again. And it's chilly out. And right up until the winter snowstorms. That's right up until the winter <laughs> snowstorms. Although in Indiana, I'll tell you, like the winters, the last couple of winters have not been that bad. There's been oh, basically right? one or two days of like really rough snow, but the rest of it was just cold. Oh, okay. You know? but, but, and then some days it was weird. Like you'd have like, it would snow. And then it would stop and then the sun would come out and it would all melt. And then it, and then it would get warm enough where it might rain or hail or do other kinds of crazy shit. Oh, geez. So I was reading the forecasts of like what, what our winter might be because of El Nino and all that. Right. And it looks like my, they say we're in for a balmy winter in like my neck oh. of the woods. Yeah. So, uh, they've been saying that like, I don't know about winter, but they've been saying that October is going to be better than usual for, for temperature. And I mean, Obviously, climate change is awful and, and all of oh, this. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but come on. <laughs> nice, Weather's... nice warm October. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like, like, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, I remember as a kid, like, I remember by the time you got into the end of September, early October, it was chilly out. Like, it was yeah. pretty out chilly. Yeah. That's not really the case anymore. You get into, you know, you get into the end of September, it's still 70s at where I right. live. And uh, it doesn't really get cold. Until early to like mid October, that's yeah. when temps will start to kind of drop. Yeah, we used to like you can always kind of gauge the winter based on Halloween. Mm -hmm. like, if you have snow on Halloween, then your winter might be pretty harsh. But if you're if you got clean streets and like a, a decent night on Halloween night, then maybe it's not going to be so bad. That's true. That's true. That is true. Yeah, I, I I'm trying to remember. Sometimes I think. I think Halloween's on like a Tuesday this year or something. I can't remember. What was it? I can't remember. But basically like, yeah. Or it might rain. That's kind of the other thing too. If you mm. got a rainy Halloween, then it's like there's a whole other thing too. Yeah. Um, but yeah. All the more reason why it's important to plan. <laughs> nice segue. Nice. Thank you. Well Thank done. You. Thank you very much. So tonight's book is one of my favorite books. I love this book. I've read it multiple times. Um, and it's one of its writers is somebody who I follow very regularly and whose like view of science and the role of science and politics and all of it really gels with me. So, um, so tonight we're going to be talking about, uh, the people's Republic of Walmart by, um, Lee Phillips and Mikhail Rosorsky. Cool. I want to preface what I'm going to talk about with that book, with talking about Phillips's other book. Okay. So Phillips also wrote another book that's called Austerity Ecology and the Collapse Porn Addicts, which is a, which that's doesn't quite have a title. That's quite a, quite a title. And his, which is sort of his first book. Um, uh, 
Lee Phillips is a science writer. I think he's one of the best science writers on the left. He regularly contributes to Jacobin and a bunch of other publications. Cool. Um, the People's Republic of Walmart, I think, was a book that was published sort of in conjunction with Jacobin magazine here in the U.S., um, which is sort of the main uh, magazine or thought leader for sort of democratic socialist left here in the U S. Right. Um, and, um, and his book, his first book on this austerity ecology and the collapse porn addicts is much more about climate change. Um, the people's Republic of Walmart touches on, on climate change a little bit, but not a lot. If you want more about like the, how economics and like, and how our modern world has sort of messed up the planet and how we're going to get out of it. Um, his first book is good about that. But he very much falls on the side that I do, which is that I, I'm very much pro science, pro technology, and I, I would also be what you might call a pro growth socialist. So I'm not much of, of the degrowther mindset, not really in that vein. Okay. Although I'm going to read more about it, I'm going to, you know, um, uh, Jason Hickel's book, not the other guy, Jackson Hinkle, the pet <laughs> socialist. <Right. laughs> yeah, you know. Um, the good one, not the Jason not the Hinkle, other one. <laughs> not Jackson Hinkle. Their names are so close, so I always yeah. have to emphasize. There's another book out on degrowth that Verso published. I'm going to check out too. Um, and that basically, it took it, it was economic development that got us into this mess, and it's going to be economic development that gets us out. And that's essentially like kind of the argument that Lee okay. Phillips makes. He's also one of the few on the left who sort of uh, is a huge proponent of nuclear power, which I am too. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that he's in the same camp that I am, which is that if we do radically want to decarbonize our economy and our world, then wind and solar are not enough. They're a yeah. part of the solution. They're a big part of the solution, but you have to have nuclear to do it. Mm -hmm. That's at least my opinion. Um, and I know people have said differently. I know Christian Perenti has, and, and there was a very great, during the pandemic, Christian Parenti and Lee Phillips debated on the subject of nuclear power on, a, on the Jackman YouTube channel. And it's oh. very, very good. I think it's a very good discussion because I think Christian is one of the Parenti, who's Michael Parenti's son, um, is probably one of the best, I think, critics of nuclear power on the left. I okay. think he doesn't fall into the same sort of what I call the sort of new age woo woo crunchy bullshit that a, that the left tends to fall into. Right. But I don't care about. He's much more practical and kind of lays out why he's against nuclear power. Lee Phillips sort of lays out why he's for it. That's a very good debate. I highly encourage people to look at it. For sure. But the first book, Austerity Ecology, sort of he's very critical of the modern environmental movement. He's actually quite critical of Naomi Klein. He's oh, very crit he's quite critical of um, people like Bill McKibben and others who are essentially arguing for what he calls austerity ecology, that the way for us to get out of this crisis is to have less stuff. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing, but his whole argument kind of comes down to, but if you really take it to its logical conclusion, a lot of these sort of like anti-growth or degrowth arguments are essentially Malthusian and that they, they basically argue mm. that there's just a certain amount of stuff that we're going to have and the population growth, or there's going to be too many people, and it's going to be a problem. He's like, no, no, no. The, the stuff isn't necessarily the problem. The economic mode of production is the problem. Capitalism is the problem. And if you reorganize society on a socialist basis with planning, you'll okay. have a better economic society, and you'll have a, a more healthy ecology because we're okay. planning society rather than the anarchy that we see all around us. I'm so, not sure I agree, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it for what it's worth. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, I think, I think there's a ton of stuff in capitalism that is bullshit. And like it, in terms of stuff that's yeah. made, right? Yeah. And there is too much stuff. There's I don't know. too much stuff in the sense that. <laughs> there's literally too much stuff. Too much right? stuff. Like, I think there's an argument to be made that there is too much stuff that's not really in the service of helping yeah. people live better lives, right? I think, I think that that's, that's the key there. That's the key there, right? So it's like, yes, there's like, uh, you know, so if we were to be, I think it's much better to sort of use our resources to, to make things like medical supplies and like clothing yep. and things like that, yep. uh, rather than say like, you know, cheap maybe plastic spend some shit. of our, yeah, maybe spend some of our, some of our energy distributing the massive quantities of food that we produce and then throw away. Exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. 
And I'm not doing his book as much of a justice. That first oh, I'm book, sure, it's yeah. great. It's because he lays out sort of the genealogy of the sort of um, the anti, what he sort of broadly sort of labels as the anti-progress left. The, the people who sort of don't believe in development as the way of, of developing societies. Right, like, uh, like primitivists almost. Like. Yes, it's like primitivists, but essentially that sort of, the people who say that they're on the left and they are against austerity are are ultimately arguing for a form of austerity in the sense that they're saying, well, we're going to have to go without certain things in order to live a better life. And it's like, maybe, but like at the end of the day, there's some things that that are good that we should continue to have yes. and shouldn't yeah. get rid of. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm much more, I like Klein a lot more than he does. He tends to, he, you know, Lee Phillips tends to put his particular ire at her. I'm a big um, fan of Naomi Klein's. <laughs> I am too. I am too. But, but I think my critic his criticisms of her are, are not bad. And ultimately I think my main, my main criticism of her is that, and it's not so much with like the shock doctrine and stuff, which I love that book. Yeah. But it's more of her reporting on the climate and stuff like that, where I don't know how to describe it. It's like she writes almost in a literary way about this oh, shit okay. instead of writing about it in like a real like science and, and sort of like clearly okay. like here's I mean, it's like she's sort of you know, she's written essays about sort of lamenting the, the sort of loss of these habitats and having a son and her son not being able to like experience these things. And that's kind of very beautiful and touching. But, but at the end of the day, like, it doesn't really, what the fuck are you trying to tell me? Like, it's like, it doesn't really uh, solve it. Like, you know, there are 8 billion people on the planet. We have yeah. all these problems. You kind of have to figure out how we're going to solve those problems. Yeah. Like, oh, it, it may be, I guess, her style of writing, mm -hmm. right? It, it, she is a very, like, uh, she has a very beautiful style of writing. <laughs> she like, does. In, even yeah. in the shock doctrine, like, the words are horrific, <laughs> but yeah. the style of writing is very amazing like and, and 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 lee phillips to his credit is a pretty good writer too it's very different it's okay. he's he's very funny um i think i mean he has a title like austerity ecology and the collapse porn addicts which is very funny um i think that there is a sort of apocalypticism on the left which needs yes. to be abandoned yeah um right. and he's very critical of that that it's like again all the you know Technology and the development of, of our econ economic systems is what got us into this mess, and that's what's going to get us out of it. You can't you can't sort of put the toothpaste back in the tube. Right. The, what right. you can do is is develop a better toothpaste tube. Like you, you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. and so that's what he means. And so like you can see the influences of people who actually aren't on the left, but who have this kind of this kind of mode of thinking. Um, the two that come off of my head are like um, Amartya Sen, the, the Nobel Prize winning economist who wrote Development is Freedom, okay. because I'm very much of the mindset that development is freedom. The, the problem is not development. The problem is capitalist development. Right, right. Um, and the other one is the libertarian Julian Simon, who um, is so, – so like in the sort of economics, like in sort of the environmental debate – there, most people fall into sort of two camps. There's the Malthusians and the Cornucopians. And uh, like Klein and Bill McKibben and those folks, they're Malthusians. They kind of basically believe that like it's the human, it's human organizations itself that are the problem. Like we have to kind of scale back our activity or else we're going to destroy the planet. Like it's, it's, they are against capitalism, but it's almost deeply more structural than that. They don't, okay. they think that basically they see it as a zero sum game where it's like, well, if we have to do this in order to get to the future that we want to get to, which is lower carbon emissions, where we're improving the climate and humans can flourish, we have to make deep sacrifices today in order to get to that future. Okay. That's kind of the argument they're making. The cornucopians, people like uh, Julian Simon, um, uh, and Lee Phillips kind of falls in this camp on the left or Norman Borlaug, not Norman Borlaug, but um, Bjorn Lomborg, skeptical environmentalist. A lot of these people who are on the other end of it, many who are on the right, but mostly, but some who are on the left, like Lee Phillips are like, uh, you know, technology and economic development provide us with abundance. And that very abundance is going to be the, the tool by which we solve our problems. Okay. You know? And so if you look at, 
societies whose carbon dioxide emissions have dramatically gone down, they're ones with high levels of economic development mixed with regulatory policy. Like the United States is a good example of this. Mm. And, uh, and so it's not fair to the developing countries to say, we're going to cut you off because if we don't, the planet's fucked because yep. it was our fault. Yep. So right. like, it's not like it's the global South of the people who are going to have to experience the problems of climate change the most. And they're the ones who more than anybody else have the right to develop more yep. than we do. Yep. So like, it's not their fault. It's ours. And we have to, yeah, own that. it's, it's, uh, it's a complicated argument because that mm-hmm. has also been used in very bad faith by some on the, on the right yes. to just straight up deny climate change. Yes. And deny basically, any action on it. <laughs> and that's or people who are sort of like climate skeptic, like not skeptical, but basically their, their whole argument is it either falls into the climate change isn't a, it doesn't exist or climate change does exist, but it's not really the problem you think it is. Like it's not as right. big of a problem as you think it is. Yeah. Somebody or, like you, yeah, or there's the uh, climate change is happening, but it's a natural phenomenon. It's a natural or- thing. Most, I think, people today fall into the climate change is a thing. Humans have caused it. But it's not as bad as you think. But it's not as bad a problem as you think yeah. it is. Bjorn Lomborg is a good example of that. Yeah, not a big um, fan, actually. Um, <laughs> you know, fan. I've read two of his books. <laughs> um and I have this. I have a copy of the Skeptical Environmentalist. I'm 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 interested in reading what he lays out. And then there's another climate scientist who wrote a book called The Lomborg Deception, where he lays out like where right. he gets the math wrong. Because that's the thing too is that like Lomborg's an economist. Mm-hmm. He's a statistician. He's not somebody who works. He's not a climate scientist. He's not a climate scientist. So it's like yeah. you have to like kind of you know. But basically, his argument boils down to the. We need development because through economic development, we can create the science and technology that will get us out of this mess. Yeah, I, I guess the difference, the the, the question yeah. always is like, what do you mean by economic development? Exactly. Like, that's the that's the trick, right? Like, do you mean continuing along the lines of uh, environmental, uh, like just burning fossil fuels and doing all the things that we're doing now? Or do you mean like cutting back on, on uh, emissions in some ways and trying to you know, trying out different types of energy and whatnot. Yes. And that you gave me the perfect segue to move into my <laughs> talking about the book, the actual book. Yeah. So the people, so the people's Republic of Walmart, which is a very provocative title and one that I think is funny and cool. Um, uh, it talks about this very problem. So um, development can be done really one of two ways. It can either be capitalist development and that it's, predicated on the profit motive. And so most of the resources that are diverse, sort of divvied up within that system are predicated on profit. Or it's socialism, where it's not profit that drives, but rather human need. Hmm. But what they argue is that this idea that economics is all about like the free market versus planning is nonsense. That's not true. So one from the outset, there's one thing I think is important is that capitalism is not markets and capitalism is not competition um, and it's yeah. not anarchy. It's not. It's none of those things. Um, not in the small a anarchy sense and in the big a anarchy sense. No, that's right. Yeah. Um, it's not. Because all economic systems involve planning. All of yeah. them do. Yeah. And so the people's Republic of Walmart as a book. So Lee Phillips is the science journalist. Rick Mikhail Rosorsky is an, I think an economist. Okay. Um, and they wrote it together. And in the book, they argue that there are these certain types of, of economic behemoths in our global capitalist system, firms like Walmart and Amazon um, that in some ways are sort of sowing the seeds for socialism. And you could go, well, how the hell How the hell are they doing that? (laughs) Right. And it really comes down to planning. So this is something that uh, this discussion tonight will be a really great complimentary episode to the episode we did on Friedrich Engels' book, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. Okay. I'm going to preface what I'm going to say later on about their book with talking a minute about Engels. So in Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, Engels lays out how um, the development of capitalism sort of in its very nature could lead to so the development of capitalism can lead to socialism precisely because 
you're seeing what he called the socialization of production. Mm -hmm. That's planning. That's what he means right. by that. And that within firms, there's a tremendous amount of socialization of planning, not just among the workers, but among the management, the workers. There's planning all the way down from top to yeah. bottom. And that it's the distribution, which is then anarchic, which is true. You, know, you, you, you have a deeply planned internal economy within a firm, which then has to compete in the marketplace. Which right, is right. to a greater or lesser extent planned too, in the sense that markets do not exist in nature. They're right. Not they, they're not something that sort of naturally appear. Yeah. You know, and markets are different Although, from like uh, many yeah. capitalists, the economists would disagree. They they fully believe that <laughs> this is a myth. Market this is, is like a, a central thing. myth <laughs> that government, like governments or yeah. any kind of legislation or government creates markets yeah. markets don't exist on their own now there's bartering there's trade those are things that go but back markets to, are but specific markets thing, yeah. specifically markets yeah. are a political construct they're not an economic one yeah um so Engels says like one of the ways that you have socialism is just to take take that socialization of production to distribution that you have not just planning and making things but you have planning and distributing things mm -hmm. and not just within the firm or the, the capitalist enterprise or the enterprise, but outside of the enterprise as well. And that's pretty much what uh, Phillips and Rozorski talk about in the People's Republic of Walmart. So let's take the two examples that are really important, the one that's in the title and the other one, so Walmart and Amazon. Okay. Walmart, what made Walmart so successful? Um, part of it was really terrible things, like horrible, shitty, low-wage jobs with no benefits, and erratic work schedules yeah. that pushed people into poverty often put them on government benefits. There's a terrific documentary that came out. I think I was in maybe high school or early college called The People's Re uh, not the People's Republic. It's called um, Walmart: The High Cost of Low Price. Okay. Um, it's put out by Brave New Films. Robert Greenwald, excellent documentary, laying out the problems of Walmart and specifically the way in which they. Uh, they put pressure on suppliers to provide them with material and, and they often lead to outshoring jobs overseas. Um, you know, the, the deindustrialization of America, poor wages, and that the fact that many a Walmart employee lives on government benefits because they don't make enough. Mm -hmm. So in effect, the federal government is subsidizing the existence of Walmart. Yeah. Um, and uh, so definitely check that out. Walmart, the high cost, low price, I think is what it's called. Um, so that's all the bad shit about Walmart. And and they make a very clear point. They're like, we're not like Walmart stands in this sense. Like we're not saying that like Walmart's amazing. What we're saying is that there is one thing that Walmart does very, very well. And so does Amazon. <laughs> that is something that could be used to build the world, the socialist world that we want, which is planning. <laughs> so what made Walmart unique was the development of technology and specifically technology and logistics that allowed them to thrive. So, you know, in the old days, uh, before Walmart and Amazon, um, a lot of times firms would provide department stores or, or your local stores with products without any rhyme or reason. You know, they would make a certain amount of them. Sometimes they'd make too much. Sometimes they'd make too little. And often that was almost always determined by the manufacturer rather than the retailer itself. That was pretty much how, how it worked. With Walmart, everything changed. So they started developing a real-time system. So with the introduction of the barcode sometime in the 1980s and early 90s, you know, because people think the barcode's been around forever. It really hasn't. Um, and, uh, you know, that's all a price signal. So every time that it, uh, you buy, let's say you buy a toothbrush and you buy a toothbrush at Walmart and you scan it, that information then goes back to you know, the, the home office and they have a, this is how many toothbrushes people bought today right. and, and what kind of toothbrushes that they bought and how many we should then buy. And so there's constant real time information, which then informs how Walmart uses its logistical muscle to essentially push suppliers to doing what they want, that the suppliers of material of suppliers of goods often become extensions of these firms precisely because, um, they, they, uh, because Walmart's like a monopsony, you know, it's, it's the only buyer 
rather right. than than the only right. seller. Right. Monopoly. A monopoly is 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 when you have the uh, the centralization of of the selling to one person or one or very few firms. Monopsony is when the selling uh, or the buying is in one hand or very few hands. So when Walmart has this much power, you know, let's say you want to design a new toothbrush, unless it gets sold on Amazon or Walmart, you're fucked. Like there's no way. And Walmart can say, okay, you want to, you want to sell your toothbrush in our store? You have, you have to knock off five cents. And they, and if they, if you tell them, well, then we're basically breaking even, it's not good for us. Walmart will be like, I don't care. I will find a supplier who will do that for me. So that's kind of the other sort of dark side of it. But the way that Walmart functions internally and the way that Amazon functions internally, they are behemoths of planning. So from top to bottom in terms of which products get bought, which products get sold, how they get stored in their warehouses, how they get shipped across the country, all of those are done with deep planning. All of the components of the Walmart Corporation are all interconnected and working in tandem with one another. Yeah. They're not, it's not chaos. It's all, it all has steps that all come together. Um, and so the introduction of computers and the development of logistical computer logistics tools really changed the game. Walmart was very early on in introducing a lot of this into their production and distribution of goods um, for their stores. Um, Cause Walmart has not been around forever. The first Walmart opened, I think in 1962. Um, in a very small town in Arkansas, because that's where, where it's from. Ben- Bentonville, Arkansas is the home quarter. Right. Had, they still have the, the first one there, don't they? Yeah, they still have the first Walmart there. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so, you know, when you – one other thing that they do that I think is also kind of genius is that um, one thing that they've done recently is um, they've – based upon all of this planning and and price – sort of price signals that they're getting through – their um, integrated planned internal system, um, they made very, very big decisions about how things ran in their stores. So for example, one of the things they did was they made their shelves uh, shorter. If, you know, at Walmart, when I was younger, the, the shelves were very, very tall. So you often weren't able to, to grab things, you whatever. And Walmart realized that it's actually easier and cheaper for us to just constantly bring in new goods that get sold off of shorter shelves than to have taller shelves. Right. So they shorten the shelves in order for the system to work more efficiently because it's all about efficiency. Yeah. So, um, so that's where Walmart is kind of this like marvel of planning. And so you take what Walmart did and you give it to Amazon and with Amazon, it's like it on steroids. So Amazon's even bigger. So, so Amazon has a, a unique barcode for each item that goes through their warehouses or fulfillment centers, as they call them. These are deeply, deeply planned systems. Yeah. You, know, you hear stories of workers who've worked there in these really degrading conditions where they're basically like, I'm essentially a robot, you know, and, and the, 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 I'm getting constant real-time information, these little like things that they have to wear or hold on to that gives them information. Like I have to do this in this amount of time in order to get to this end result. If I don't, and if I have a certain amount of demerits, I get fired. Yeah. An average Amazon worker is only there for three years. Amazon predicates itself on basically chewing up people and spitting them out. They have no interest in long term, And that's right. not just the warehouse workers. That's the white collar workforce too. That's right. the software developers. That's the people at, at in the more cushier, what you would call white collar jobs in the software development and in the development end, they're also, they've got a tremendous amount of pressure on them too. And it's a deeply planned integrated system where the warehouse knows what the home office is doing and vice versa. Walmart works the same way. Mm. This is why people have made the joke that in uh, Amazon, they have basically these big ass bins and in these bins, there's no rhyme or reason to it. If you looked at it, just from a pure standpoint of as, as a person, you'd look at it like, this is fucking chaos. Like, what's going on here? Right. But the reason that it looks like it's chaos is because they figured out the shortest amount of times for certain items to go in order to be more efficient in maximizing profit for whatever they're selling. This is why you can have like a children's book. And this, and this is a point they make in the book. You know, this is why you can have a, a bin of Amazon products where it's like a toothbrush and a children's book and a sex toy all in the same bin. It doesn't matter. 
And so it's, um, it's irrelevant what type of stuff, what type because, of stuff it is. Yeah. It's all about whatever the barcode has you going in and out at any given time. Um, and so, and often people buy random shit to go together. Right. So it's like, you know, True. sometimes, you know, like we've bought, you know, like for me, it's like, sometimes I've bought like, you know, like this neck massage thing and a book, or I've bought like, you know, I bought cat food, but then I also bought like a sex toy, uh, a sex toy right? Like there's all these. <laughs> and yeah, so Amazon obviously. doesn't make those like distinctions. Like, so it doesn't like lay out its warehouses. Like in the past you would have laid out your warehouse. Like, okay, all the sex toys are here. And like, yeah, the dog that's right here. Like, and it's like, no, it doesn't do any of that shit. Cause it's, it's recognized that it's much more efficient and, and better planning to not do that because then it's, it's, you cut down the time in which things have to be pulled. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, so. I did Instacart uh, deliveries for a while, which is mm-hmm. you go in and you buy the groceries and you deliver them to people. Yeah. And often the way that Instacart groups things together doesn't sync up with the way that stores put things onto shelves. So then you're always like, okay, well here's my list. I've got to go through five different aisles to get the, these five items, and then I've got five more items that are five different aisles again, and like. It's a mm-hmm. mess. So obviously some, one of those is out of sync, right? Right, right. And with Amazon, they don't have those kinds of fuck ups in the sense yeah. that, <laughs> yeah. it, it, or Walmart for that matter. I mean, they don't basically, they, they recognize how, they would recognize how inefficient that is. So like yeah. they would, like if Amazon was running Instacart, what they would do is they would sort of re, they would develop extremely complex logistical algorithms to basically put those in order so that you can start from the front of the store and go all the way to the back and then leave. Yeah. Yeah. Or if they are going to be in a bunch of different places, then it's, it will still take you less time if you bump around in this certain way. Right. Rather than, you know, if it lays you out, because that's what Amazon does. Like the workers will tell you, like, it tells me where to walk. It tells me what to pick up. It tells me what to drop off. It tells me when to leave. It tells me when to go. But yeah. you have no, there's no agency in it. It's all figured out. Yeah. So it's this marvel of. Yeah, Calm. Oh, I'm yeah. from some random geek. Customers who bought this item also bought these items. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So Amazon, and they mentioned this in the book, Amazon patented what they called something along the lines of like, um, presumptive ordering. So it would order and ship something to you even before you really even knew you needed it. But ultimately you kind of would need it. And they've kind of implemented something like this because this book's a few years old now. They've kind of implemented something like this in the sort of auto subscription subscription model where it's like, basically you can set that up. It sends it to you. You don't think about it. You know? And it asks you if you like, if you buy like grocery items from Amazon, mm-hmm. it'll, it just asks you, would you like to set up a subscription for this? Mm-hmm. Like I, uh, I, I found that when I, I, cause I ordered a case of my favorite, uh, energy drink and it's like, would you like to get this every two weeks? And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just need this those one time. <laughs> I just needed the one time. Right. Yeah. Because again, it's, it's planning for you. It's these, yeah. all of these very complex algorithmic uh, software developments mixed with like cutting edge logistics leads to um, this sort of efficiency and utility maximizing behemoth. Um, and, uh, and for good or ill, that's the world we live in now. And that, 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 you know, and so the point, the broader point that they're making with their book is that capitalism requires planning. Mm-hmm. Any economic system requires planning. This idea that everything is left up to the market or that you can create markets within a firm or an institution is absurd. Yeah. It almost never works. So if Amazon is an example of, uh, or and Walmart are examples of planning that work, what's an example of when doing chaos doesn't work? When, when you explicitly reject economic planning and you go with the sort of free market ideology, um, you look no further than what happened to Kmart. Okay. So Kmart and Sears, I've been on a kick for this for years because people need to know this. So for a long time, Kmart and Sears, Sears was, of course, you know, the department store that was sort of the one of the largest employers in the United States, which today, by the way, Walmart is the largest private employer in the oh. United States. Um, mm. And so, uh, which, you know, 60, 50... 60, 70 years ago, it was General Motors. So 
you take that with what you will. Um, but uh, but basically, there was a guy who came into Walmart uh, into Kmart rather, and 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 his guy named Eddie Lampert. And Eddie Lampert was an Ayn Rand acolyte. He very much believed in the sort of Atlas shrugged. Let's okay. let's have the perfect use of yeah, the market. I think I've heard this before. Kind of thing. Yeah. And what he did was instead of having Kmart be a deeply planned internal economy that then sold its goods on a market, he actually developed internal markets within Kmart itself. So each division ended up becoming its own firm within the firm, and it had to compete with other divisions within the firm. This led to disasters because, for example, it, there, the, the appliance division was separate from the marketing division. Right. So the appliance division, well, the appliance division at the time was Kenmore Appliances. That's what Sears and Kmart sold was Kenmore right. Appliances. The marketing and development end didn't know what the other company, the other part of the company was doing. And so, and so the, the marketing and sales department had to pay licenses to the Kenmore, like to the actual manufacturing and distribution of the appliances had to pay them a license to sell the Kenmore ones. Jeez. And so they realized it's actually just cheaper for us to sell non Kenmore shit. So then they start selling, selling other stuff because yeah. they don't have to pay the licenses. Right. So it's this constant system of Pete, you know, Rob and Peter to pay Paul. And over time, the company essentially cannibalizes itself. Yeah. And in doing so, Kmart and, and Sears are basically a thing of the past. They almost don't exist today. Um, so this is an example of where planning would have actually helped them tremendously. <laughs> and they yeah. didn't do it. But planning is socialism. But planning is socialism, which is what they say. And it's like, no, it's not. Like planning is not necessarily socialism because – Capitalism has a tremendous amount of planning with yeah, it. Yeah, clearly. But difference is, is it's planning for what ends. Yeah. This is why I keep trying to stress to people that capitalism is not markets. Capitalism is not entrepreneurship. Capitalism is the private ownership of the means of the production with the, with, with the, with the principle of profit driving everything. Yeah. And the maximization of surplus value. That's what it is. So you can have a lot of economic planning within capitalism. Good example of this is um, World War II. So there was in the United States during World War II, there was a tremendous amount of economic planning. Yeah. A lot of which had had grown out of the New Deal, um, but a lot of it was also still in private hands. So you'd have private firms being contracted up by the government mm. um, to make certain goods at certain things. So the, the government would tell them how many to make, what. To, how many to make of what thing for what purpose right. they would regulate the prices they would regulate the wages so there was all of this planning there was something called the war production board that often set a lot of this up okay. during the war um and so you know at the time you have a tremendous amount of this synergy between private enterprise and government planning going together and sometimes when the government when the private enterprise couldn't really make it work then the government would just set up plants to make things. Um, and uh, so so you have planning there. You have certain aspects of the economy which effectively get decommodified. So the example that they use is the NHS, the National Health Service in Britain. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, as, as an example of planning. And that one of the problems with the NHS at the time was instead of it being sort of democratic planning, because that's the world we want to live in, is a democratically plan society that's what yeah. socialism is socialism is democratic planning it's planning with the end result being the maximization of human flourishing that's what socialism is <laughs> yeah so you can have planning with profit and that's capitalism and it sucks generally um but in the nhs instead of having sort of more democratic planning they had technocratic planning where it was sort of rule where it was planning solely by experts and when the public wasn't as involved it allowed for the neoliberal turn under Thatcher to sort of start to dismantle the NHS in fits oh. and starts. And so today, the NHS is is not quite what it used to be because it used to be mostly owned by the you know you worked for the government. It was you know um, and they instituted all kinds of reform reforms into NHS that was supposed to maximize. Um, the competition, it was supposed to create market incentives and drive efficiencies. And what happened was that instead of 5% of the NHS budget being devoted towards 
the cost of administrators, that went up to 15%. So you had thousands of more administrators within the system to make it less planned. The goal was to build in competition in, okay. and market incentives into a system that worked well on its own with planning. So it's so planning often is the cheaper, better option. Yeah. One people one thing what people say about economic planning is well, what about innovation? What they don't realize, because here's the other thing too. What's one of the stupid arguments that goes around the internet about socialism that is like absurd, which is the but look at the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> they often will say, but you're saying this on an iPhone. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. The vast majority of the technologies within the, within the iPhone were developed by government planning. Yeah, that's right. Most of them were developed by DARPA, which is the, um, the, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency or, or administration. DARPA developed a lot of the things, whether it was the touch internet, screens. Right? The internet was, <laughs> was DARPAnet. Yeah. It was DARPAnet. We talked about that in, when we talked about Ben Turnoff's book. The internet was basically grown out of agencies within the Department of Defense needing to talk to one another. So, you know, but one of the biggest drivers of, because here's the thing, right? Spending money on research and development and innovation and entrepreneurship gets in the way of profits. Yeah. Most firms don't want to do it because it's not profitable. So one of the things that's important is that just because something is useful doesn't mean that it's profitable and vice versa. Um, and, yeah, sorry. Uh, some random geek says, uh, I've gotten that from liberals. Why do you as an anarchist have a smartphone? I guess I can't have nice things once I'm an anarchist. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, and it's part of its marketing, right? Like it's, it's they, the way that the iPhone is sold is it's this sold by this gene. It's like, it's like people, I think if you actually ask them, I think they genuinely believe. Or at the very least, they have this like childlike idea in their head. Steve Jobs like, invented Steve Jobs the iPhone. <laughs> literally invented the iPhone. He developed every single component of it with his bare yeah. fucking hands yeah. in a room all by himself. He's a genius. That's that's how that works, right? And that's and and it's this soul, this sort of soul genius that like changes the world, right? That's the, that's the sort of Ayn Rand, John Galt nonsense. kind of view nonsense, right? <laughs> Whereas most innovations are actually done collectively, especially in the biomedical you know, in biomedical sciences, a lot of the development of, um, you know, vaccines or any kind of antibiotics, for example, there haven't really been any new developments in antibiotics within the last couple of two, three decades. And the main reason for that is because it's not profitable. Yeah, yeah. So we could go back to a time where our antibiotics don't work and we have to chop off people's limbs to save them from infection because firms do not want to spend money on research and development for antibiotics because they don't make any money off of them. Yeah, that's right. And in the book, they talk about how, um, you know, a lot of times new, new medications are often just rehashes of old ones because it's, yeah. it's cheaper and easier to do that than it is to develop something new. Yeah. For example, I, I know of this in my own life personally. Uh, so I have allergies. I have chronic allergies. Um, and I use nasal sprays for my, my sinus and, and allergy congestion. For years, I used a medication called Dimista which was very, very expensive once the generic got on the market. The way health insurance works in America is absurd. <laughs> By the time a generic, so before a generic came out, the manufacturer offered a sort of manufacturer's coupon and it was $29. And so for like two years, I paid $29 for it every month. Okay. And, uh, and then once the generic came out, that coupon went away because now there's no, because you can just buy the generic. Yeah. Well, under my health insurance, the generic was still more expensive than the name brand. For fuck's sakes. And the name brand would, would fluctuate all of the time. And I remember meeting with my allergist and him saying to me, he's like, look, I got a solution for you on this. This, this nasal spray is basically a formulation of two separate nasal spray, sprays into one. It's fluticasone and azelastin. You put those two together and you get dimesta. He's like, if you want to switch, instead of doing two sprays in each nostril a day, you do four sprays in each nostril a day, you, I can save you a lot of money. So that's what I do now. I do two drugs instead of one, because all they missed it is, is, a, two drugs. is a combination of two drugs yeah. in one. That's all it is. Jesus. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing, it's something unique. It's just they took two things and mashed them together. Um, yeah. And so when it comes to like the development... A good example in a more recent memory uh, is COVID, right? The COVID vaccines, right? You know, you know, Project Warp Speed, right? Like they were developed in government labs with government money, 
and, and then somehow of, ended up in private hands. <laughs> and it's ended up in private hands, in, and and that now people are being charged for the vaccine. And this is very common. I mean, this stuff happened in Sorry. World War II as well. Like once World War II ended, the War Production Board was shot da- shut down, and a lot of the f- forces of production were put back into private hands, right. and a lot of the wage and price and and industry controls were taken away. It's the same fucking thing. Where it's you private you socialize. The losses and you privatize the gains. This happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. So, you know, the COVID vaccine happened with government money and government labs with government planning. That's how that works. Um, and so, you know, so innovation is something that like can absolutely happen with planning and in many respects happens precisely because of planning. Yeah. Because innovation is, like you say, like it's a, a collective action. It's a collective it's enterprise. Yeah. Multiple minds working for the betterment of. Of the uh, society, basically. Yep, exactly. And so that was, you know, for example, the development of penicillin. Um, you know, when Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in his lab in England, um, you know, he was sort of the discoverer of this as a possibility, a penicillin sort of being one of the first antibiotics. Um, and then uh, it was brought sort of to ramp up production. And, in, and, um, like, and, it was in private hands at first to try to ramp up production of penicillin right. going into the war and private firms couldn't figure it out. They're like, we just can't get it. We can't make it work. And the government said, forget it then we'll do it ourselves. So then they started to work and they started to build labs and they started government planning to figure out how to mass produce penicillin and mm-hmm. they figured it out. So they went from, you know, millions of doses of penicillin for the, for soldiers to trillions of doses of per soldier for you know so by the time that you get to the normandy invasion in 1944 they're producing like eight trillion doses of penicillin right in these government-run factories with government planning again planning works yeah the question is whether or not it's democratic planning which is which is for the benefit of everybody or if it's technocratic planning or capitalist planning in the service of a few yeah so one of the other things that people often talk about is you know um and the way they frame it in the book is like you know there was that pesky thing called the soviet union and uh and that's true so so yeah they talk a lot about the soviet union in the book um about how a lot of socialist economic planning that was developed in the soviet union was kind of a marvel some of it was anyway i mean you went from yeah. a backward peasant society to being the second largest industrial power in 50 years yeah it's pretty impressive um but it took a, but it was a lot of human misery to get there. One of the arguments that people make, um, specifically Alec Nove makes in his book, An Economic History of the USSR, which they quote heavily throughout the People's Republic of Walmart. Um, and may, and I have that book, the, the Nove book. We'll maybe do it or something, some yeah. in the future episode. But basically, like he makes the argument that planning basically leads to authoritarianism. That 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 it's <laughs> it, it's it's it's. Right. Of course. Because Nov, Nov was a market socialist, so he basically argued that the way to socialism was through worker cooperatives that competed with one another in a marketplace, and then yeah. some things were decommodified, like public utilities and healthcare and things like that, transportation. But that's not true. And what they argue in the book, in the People's Republic of Walmart, it's it's actually the other way around. Mm-hmm. That socialism, like authoritarianism, breeds bad planning because. Because the authority, the the autocrat who's in power, in, in the case of, of the Soviet Union, it was Stalin, yeah. didn't like any information that would counter whatever they wanted. So one of the things that happened during the purges of the 1930s was a lot of these civil servants and scientists and engineers and economists, all these people who were sort of building the planned economy of the Soviet Union, were taken off the board. It's they funny. Were to, yeah. <laughs> I, I uh, years ago, I was talking to uh, somebody, and they sent me uh, a book called uh, "Basic Economics," and it's by Tom- oh, I thought that was by it's Thomas Sowell. By, Soul. by yeah. Tom- Thomas Sowell, and uh, in it, he very explicitly uh, blames uh, the lack of ability to plan because he's not you're not adapting to natural market forces. So he blames the fall of like the social like the problems in the Soviet Union on this attempt to plan. <laughs> that's absolutely absurd so like yeah. i mean if you if you look at socialist economic planning goes back to the revolution so you have 1917 you have the the revolution then you have 
the institution of war communism during the um, during the Russian Civil War, which led to certain liberalization of the economies where they left up some things up to market forces. That then developed in what was called the NEP, or the New Economic Program, which again was like, the, we are going to plan and own in public some things, and we're going to leave some things to private hands. This all starts to go away by the time that you get to the first five-year plan under Stalin, right? Where they, where you have two things kind of connected together. You have the co- collectivization of agriculture, and you have the development of the industrial base, because a lot of people in Russia were in Soviet Union were leaving the cities because there was no fucking food, so they were going back to being farmers because they're like, at least I can eat that way. Yeah, I can and, go and make my own food. <laughs> But in order for for the Soviet Union to hit its industrial targets, it needed the agricultural base to do that. And the only way that they thought to get to that was through the collectivization of the agriculture, which was a huge disaster. You know, obviously the famines that happened, the, the Holodomor crisis, which right. led to millions of people dying. You know, it's a fact. It's not something that was made up. It's true. This stuff happened. Um, and uh, And so the collectivization of agriculture was in a lot of ways a disaster. But again... It was bad planning. Right. And I know that's like cheap because, and easy to say, yeah. but but it yes. was bad planning in the sense that like all of these civil servants, all these people who had all this information within the Soviet Union were not involved in the, in the planning process because yeah. they were, they were either thrown in the fucking gulag or they were killed. It's then if, yeah. you, uh, if you want like a, a sort of an analog, it's not agriculture, but like uh, uh, you look at the Vietnam war, right? Like, yes, there was a lot of like, people who knew that this was a disaster and it was a consistent disaster happening over and over again. And that the people in charge, the authoritarians, Nixon and his, his generals refused to listen to them. Yes. (laughs) Basically. Bad planning on that. uh, And it led to a disaster. Or it was bad planning even before when you had secretary of defense, Robert McNamara, essentially lying to president Johnson. Right. Like, in private, McNamara would be like, this is a shit show, but then like lying to Johnson. Johnson privately also knew that the Vietnam War was a shit show. <laughs> and that um, basically, it, it you know, he always said, he's like, I, I let go of my lifelong love of the great society for that whore Vietnam. Like that's the way he described it. He was like, he, in order to build the sort of social democratic society that he wanted, uh, it, you know, it, it it was sort of undermined by Vietnam. I mean, the thing is, just as a quick side point, like Johnson knew pretty much by by sixty four, right like before Gulf of Tonkin, that Vietnam would be a shit show. He knew yeah. it. Yeah. He knew it. And and um, well, how could you not? Because there was people yeah. constantly telling. Like I I can't remember the names. I just uh, remember like there was people saying over and over again to the administration, "Hey." This is bad. This is going badly. It's going to continue to go badly. Yeah. And 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 you had cheerleaders. I mean, so many of the people I often think that if Johnson had when he became president in, in after Kennedy's assassination in 1963 and maybe forces were too strong, maybe there was no way out of it, but I have a I have a feeling that if he had purged mm. a lot of like the national security people and replaced him with his own people right away maybe Vietnam wouldn't have happened because all the people who got us into Vietnam were all Kennedy people. And it was Dean Rusk. It was, it was Robert McNamara. It's all those, it's all those people who were, who were Kennedy appointees. There were all these people who very much believed in it. Um, And in a dark form of planning, you know, a lot of the development of Vietnam policy was developed by the Rand corporation out of these sort of strategic algorithms. It was sort of war by planning. That was a disaster. So bad that's planning. another bad example of bad <laughs> planning, right? Yeah. Because ultimately it, it, it misunderstood some of the fundamental assumptions. And so people will then ask like, with the Soviet Union, like, well, how did you go from like the shit show of the Stalin era to like Sputnik and like Yuri Gagarin and shit? And they talk about that in the book, that the sort of the Khrushchev era in the mm-hmm. late 50s, early 60s, where you see the Soviet Union kind of at its apex, like at right. its point, um, uh, is... A lot of it had to do with the development of better economic planning. A lot of the economic planning models that had been developed by Soviet and American economists in the 1920s were largely ignored by the the political establishment in the Soviet Union because of Stalin. And so in the late 1950s, after the thaw, um, that, uh, you know, all of these 
I mean, all of these economic planners are going back to these old models and realizing, oh, there's a lot of utility here. And this is where you get the development of not just a strong industrial base, but a strong consumer goods base. So the Soviet Union was very good at this, but they made some very fatal mistakes. Mm. And one of the fatal mistakes they did was instead of developing their own computer sector, mm. instead of, you know, Khrushchev was ousted in 1964, Brezhnev comes into power, Brezhnev is a Stalinist. They basically reassert the more authoritarian aspects of the Soviet Union and- uh, Fucks and it, it led, up. <laughs> and fucks it up, leads it to a long-term decline. Um, and the reason that the, the Khrushchev era was better was because it was an era where where um, more political dissent was allowed, right. where um, people who had been wrongly imprisoned were released, the crimes of Stalin were made public. It was Jeez, it was an right. it was an era of opening the Soviet Union to the world and developing economically. But in the Brezhnev era in the seventies, you know, with the development of com- computer technologies, especially consumer and consumer and industrial, like professional business oriented computing. Um, the Soviet Union made a really bad mistake, and they said, no, we're not going to do any of that. We're just going to ape stuff from the Americans. We're not going to develop our own our own version of Silicon Valley. Wow. And that was to their own detriment because had they, developed, had they developed their own technology sector and their own computer sector and integrated that with cybernetics and, and developed an economy, Soviet Union might still exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's one of the big mistakes that they made. So there is bad planning. And so the argument that they make is that authoritarianism leads to bad planning, not the other way around. That. Yeah, I can agree. You with know, that. and that, you know, that if you have these authoritarians who are not, who are not, um, who are not subject to democratic constraints mm-hmm. where you don't actively involve the public in the process of planning, it will lend itself to being ossified and destructive from within. But despite how fucked up the system of the Soviet Union was, it was immensely successful in, a, in very specific ways. Right. In, in the sense that its industrial base went from being nothing to being second to the United States. Its economy was the third largest economy in the world. The only, well, not the third largest, it was the second largest economy in the world. And its growth rates were, were only less than the US and Japan. So it was the third fastest growing economy in the world for many, many years. And then it began to stagnate, and it stagnated precisely because the political leadership at the time um, became, like I said, became more and more ossified. You know, you had a succession of leaders of the Soviet Union who were old, very, very old. They died kind of one after the other. It was Brezhnev dies, and then it's uh, and then it's uh, Chernenko, and no, it's I think it's Brezhnev, and then Andropov, and then Chernenko, and they all die within a couple of years. I always tell the funny story about like, you know, when Reagan was president um, and Sam Donaldson asked him, he's like, well, when are you going to sit down with the Soviet leader, Mr. President? And Reagan says, I will when they stop dying on me, um, <laughs> which is kind of funny. <laughs> that is true. a little funny. <laughs> um, and, and Gorbachev comes into power in the mid-1980s at the, at the sprightly age of 56, which made him quite young. No kidding. For the, yeah. for the, for the leadership of the Soviet Union. Um, and the problem with this, the collapse of the Soviet Union was they tried to circle the square. Uh, essentially, they tried to integrate economic liberalization with political liberalization at the same time. Mm. Unlike what the, the the Khrushchev era did, which was political liberalization mixed with a renewed emphasis of economic planning. So, if you if he, it, it, so, they were trying to institute more market reforms into a system that couldn't handle them. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I think the lesson for the Soviet from for us for the Soviet Union is recognizing that. That p- economic planning does work, and it does work in some respects, mm-hmm. but it does not work in all of them. So, like the Soviet Union was really good at, at economic planning in regards to industrial production, right? Wasn't as good in the development of consumer goods, right? It was not as good with that. So, so yeah, so Which, like, I mean, it, yeah, may, uh, I don't know. Maybe that's not that big a deal, depending on what the consumer goods are. <laughs> right. I mean, when when I guess I, when I say consumer goods, I mean literally things like cars and toys and and like appliances and yeah. um, food and like food food's stuff. pretty big. Yeah, pretty, food's pretty, pretty big, pretty right? Important. So you know, um, and uh, and they talk a lot about a book that a novel that was written called Red Plenty, um, 
Okay. Uh, by I think the guy's name is Francis Bufford, who wrote the book, but it's about like the sort of the Khrushchev era, right? Because a lot of the ideas that we get of the sort of fully automated luxury communism, a lot of those concepts or that sort of retro wave kind of stuff that we think about, it, it's all from the Khrushchev era. It's all from that late 50s, early right. 60s, where, you know, Sputnik happened, and then you have the first man in space, you have the first woman in space. Um but by the time you get to the Brezhnev era, a lot of the problems they had with manned space flight, particularly when it came to the lunar missions, they basically just abandoned it. Right. Um, they just said, man, we're not doing that anymore. And then they, they abandoned um, development of computer technologies. So, yeah. Um, the last big thing I'd like to talk about with the book is talking about Chile and talking about um, uh, Chile as a Allende's Chile you know, pre-coup was right. the development of... Um, something I think it's called Cybersyn. And, um, but they were developing essentially their own version of the internet before the internet existed. Nice. Um, uh, Allende, who was democratically elected, um, Dr. Salvador Allende, who was democratically elected the president of Chile, I think in 1970. Um, the model of Allende was the sort of um, democratic socialist Marxist. Like it was very much, we are predicated on developing it. We are, we want to have a socialist society, but we also want to have free elections. We want to have democracy. We want to have freedom of speech. We want to have political liberties. So it was trying to go not the U S way and not the Soviet union way, but this sort of different path. And one of the things he was very interested in was the, 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 the development of cybernetics. So today we often think about, um, how the internet and and the computers and the sort of the technological revolution that's happened over the last 30, 40 years has led to behemoths like Walmart and and Amazon to be able to do what they do. Right. There's no way they could do any of it without the internet. We couldn't be doing the show without the internet. Yeah. And uh, Allende's government was very interested in developing some kind of internal um, computer network system that would develop economic planning in real time where they could then um, uh, sort of direct production on certain things, depending on what they needed. And it was going to be massively successful, but it never really got off the ground. And the big reason for that was that on September 11th, 1973, Allende and the Allende government was ousted in a coup led by essentially uh, the U S and CIA. Yeah. Um, and, um, and they, inst- and, what was installed was a military dictator named Augusto Pinochet who ruled with an iron hand for 20, de- 20 years. Yeah. Um, and then they brought in neoliberalism. So the first, you know, this, the Chicago boys, you know, the, yep. the free marketeers, they all came in, you know, um, this is all in Naomi Klein's excellent book, the shock doctrine. Yeah. We were talking about, about the shock doctrine a little bit earlier. And yeah, yeah. I love that book. I think it's great. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, the sort of socialist internet, of Chile was this sort of long gone dream <laughs> destroyed um, by capitalism, destroyed by capitalism. <laughs> right. But it was an example of democratic planning where they were going to involve the workers on shop floors in developing real time information with managers with, and then with civil servants, it was going to be this like more bottom up approach to developing um, knowledge. And it was also going to be sent decentralized where you'd have certain aspects of it in certain portions of the country and in certain firms. And it would have, it would leave a lot more to local control. And, and, and it was something that Allende really believed in and, um, and unfortunately never really came to pass, but it's, uh, is it a model that we could use for the whole world? Maybe not, but it's, I think a, um, an example that gives us a lot of pause in thinking about how we do build the world we want to build. Sure. So um, in terms of the big takeaways from the people's Republic of Walmart, economic planning works. Anybody who tells you otherwise is either like a libertarian or like, a, or just doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, same thing. Uh, same thing, basically. <laughs> um, you know, planning works that economic planning is capitalism wouldn't work without planning. Yeah. That, that, that you can't really have the kind of robust dynamic economy that we do without planning and, and development of plans yeah. that organize and socialize production, as, as um, Engels said all those years ago. And so, you know, the models of Amazon, imagine if Amazon was a worker cooperative, where right. we used all of that planning and that maximization of efficiency for good, right? That we, you know, where people 
worked for the firm for many years and had a pension and were well taken care of yeah. and actually could have fucking bathroom breaks and not have to piss in bottles and yeah you could bags. you could double or triple the workforce at Amazon and then everybody could be treated like a, like a human being yep <laughs> absolutely and and you know and ultimately you probably have better growth rates you know planned economies tend to do better like planning tends to actually maximize the utility of, of the workers and of what's being made. Like yeah. it's just, you know, um, so this idea that the, the market and we just leave it up to all solely to the market is kind of absurd. It's not how it works. It's really not how the world works at all. Nope. And that the sort of economic calculation problem isn't really a problem at all. It's a problem of a lack of, of information and the ability to process that information. That's right. And now that we live in an age where there's a tremendous amount of not just information, but the ability to process it, yeah. especially as we develop artificial intelligence technologies, yep. there's a way to do planning for real that would be incredible. So this that should be a tool we can use to our yep. advantage. <laughs> so that the computers and robots do all the work and we get to make art. That's right. That would be like, that's the, that's the, the, the end goal. So, so yeah, I highly recommend people check out the people's Republic of Walmart. We've only kind of scratched the surface. It's an excellent book, covers a lot of ground. Um, it's written in a very funny conversational style. Nice. Um, it takes stuff that could be dry or boring and makes it really engaging. And, um, and I just think Lee Phillips is one of the best writers out there. People should definitely check out his work more. I, I think he writes pretty regularly for Jacobin and other stuff. So, um, yeah, check out that book. Check out his other book about the environment. Um, because that's the other thing too. Economic planning will help with the environment. Yeah. You know, you know, if we develop a system of production and distribution where we are being more efficient and we're being healthier and we're being better to the planet, then we can alleviate a lot of the problems associated with climate change. It's it's. Yeah. So that's the, the, the goal is, is socialism, right? It's yep. democratic planning that involves everybody in the decision process. Um, and that's what they argue for. And it's what I would argue for that, you know, the world I want to live in is one where we decommodify things and yep. we plan because why leave things up to the, the, the mercy of the market? Yeah, that's right. Cause that, that cause that's nonsense. <laughs> it is. It's all nonsense. Essentially, it's a religion. I mean, I think the people who believe in capitalism are believe in a religion. I mean, it's, yeah. it's you know, it's this, I think I find as a socialist, we tend to be a lot more like realistic about human nature and how people are. And like people always say, well, people are selfish. That's why you can't have socialism. I'm like, that's precisely why we need socialism. That's because right. If you can develop systems that sort of uh, disincentivize selfishness, people will be less selfish. Not, not to bring up, uh, I yeah. guess I brought up Zoe Baker's book quite a bit in the yeah. pregame, but yeah, to bring up means and ends by Zoe Baker. Uh, she speaks of, of like the way that anarchists in the past have talked about power in general is like, we don't want, yes, we acknowledge that there are people who would abuse power. That's why you set up systems so that nobody has institutional power over other people. Right. <laughs> like that's Or if they do have institutional power, that they are subject to democratic institutions. They, they so can easily be removed from that position of power. They can be removed from the position for their abuse. And a planned society is one that has, it all, just as the kids say, has the receipts in the sense yeah. that we can look up if somebody made a fucking mistake. Yeah. Right. Like or I we would can look up if they did things on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Another Another good example of, of sort of socialist planning or, or planning in general is what I do for a living. I work for the state government and I digitize historical materials for people to access for free. And when you do it under a planned system like I do, and where there's planning from the beginning stages of digitization to the end, the end product tends to be better. The metadata tends to be better and it's better organized. Yeah. You know, if, if you go to our Hoosier State Chronicles, our state library site where we have our newspapers – we have better metadata and we have better information and organization of our papers than newspaper archive or newspapers.com, which are privately owned. We just do because it goes through additional layers of work yeah. and planning to get us to where we are. Um, so yeah, I want to live in a world of industrial democracy and planning that we, we, we make the things that we need and we distribute, we distribute them to the people we need and we use planning to get there. That sounds good to me. I yeah. guess. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're, we're getting new, new viewers here, but, uh, it's time yeah, to yeah. wrap up. So, <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I'm happy, you know, for new viewers, if you have questions or comments, please feel free. I, we can stay a few minutes and, and maybe answer questions. 
Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I guess my question <laughs> is, um, <laughs> what are we covering next time? Next time. Okay. So we've been, we've been doing a lot of, you know, new stuff or sort of the new kids on the block. We're going back to old school. So next time we're going to be doing uh reformer revolution by Rosa Luxemburg. Very nice. Um, anarchists favorite Marxist. That's right. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm very excited to be talking about Rosa on the podcast. Um, we're going to talk all about, you know, the development of workers democracy and, and workers councils, council communism and yeah. her, her sort of agreements with Lenin, her disagreements with Lenin, her criticisms of the Russian revolution and her, what you would call critical support. Um, and, uh, She's an incredibly fascinating figure, and I look forward to doing that next time. So we'll get back into the weeds with some some uh, some classic theory next time on the podcast. Very nice. And I guess all that's left is where can people find you? So you can always find me at justinclark.org. The uh, link is like right here, right there. It's always tricky <laughs> to get to the screen. Right there. There it is. Uh, that's where you can find all my writing and my and episodes of the podcast. You can find everything there. Um, I have a new article coming out about um, the order Robert Ingersoll and his memorialization of Abraham Lincoln. That's going to be in the 150th anniversary issue of The Truth Seeker, which is coming out this month. Um, it will also be available in the Indiana History blog. Um, so that's where you can find that too. Nice. Um, and then you can also follow me on social media. I'm Justin Clark PH for public history. I am on Instagram. I am on threads and I'm newly on blue sky. <laughs> thanks to my lovely yeah. co-host here, um, who sent me an invite to blue sky. So I'm going to get more involved on the, 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 the not bird app or apps plural. Yeah. Um, so you can find me there. And then I, as I always want to mention in our sort of outro, um, please support Corey on Patreon. Um, he's doing incredible work and, um, you know, our, uh, our recent video or Bertrand Russell episode has just gotten a ton of views. People yeah, really dug did, it. Did really well. And, um, and I'm really excited to keep growing the channel and keep growing the content that we're doing here. And that could not be possible without all of what Corey does. Um, so that I just get to read books and talk about them. He does a lot of the harder work. So <laughs> definitely, definitely throw him, throw him a few bucks so that, you know, he can do more and more of this and less and less of like DoorDash Bull or Dash. Instacart Bull or other <laughs> bullshit like that. Um, so, yeah. Nice. I appreciate that. Um, thank you everybody who uh, joined us in the chat and on the uh, YouTube and Twitch and whatnot. And uh, yeah, have a good one. See ya. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Uh, remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And it helps me keep the internet and power on. Thanks to my top patrons. Some Random Geek, Damien Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. These days, I also have a Substack and a ghost where you can subscribe for free or you can donate a per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities, as well as the other shows that I do. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, make sure to stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat between me and Justin.
he's got to he's got to start listening to like uh more heterodox uh yes. like economists, right? Yes. Like cuz the uh the mainstream economist view that raising inflation rates is going to help with the uh or interest rates I yep. mean, is going to help with uh, curbing inflation is not working and it's not going to work. I also don't think it's going to work. If anything, what it's going to do is it's just going to put a lot of people out of money and out of work. Uh, you know, and this but is the, that's yeah. I mean, for regular people, that's the worst thing to happen.